unbidden and unannounced, on November 29, 1839, Joseph Smith walked up to the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue and requested an audience with President Martin Van Buren. He had traveled over a thousand miles in order to seek federal assistance in regaining lands and properties and monies that had been lost in Missouri after failing in federal and local courts. Joseph Smith walks in and it became a defining moment in his life, in the life of pneumatology, and in the life of the church. He was also shortly escorted out, as Martin Van Buren said, your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you. As Joseph left, President Van Buren Bur asked him, what's the difference between your churches and others? In a, week, a week later, Joseph wrote to his brother Hiram, that they differed in the mode of baptism and in the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. And then he added this last sentence by way of additional understanding. We considered that all other considerations were contained in the gift of the Holy Ghost. Joseph's response to Van Buren and Hiram begs for a serious analysis. Joseph's understanding of the Spirit compared to other 19th century religions and their biblical interpretations has never taken place. But Joseph's thoughts on the Holy Ghost appear to fall within mainstream enthusiastic outbursts of the Second Great Awakening. But I have found that they make an abrupt and radical departure from the teachings of his day. Many historians interpret Joseph's claim to revelation as a creative response to the enthusiastic outbursts of the Second Great Awakening in upstate New York. But were Joseph's ideas entirely a product of his environment? Was his doctrine developed in reaction to his culture? Was his interpretation of the Spirit from the Bible constant with his fellow clerics? Focused research suggests not. And up to this point, academic literature has not compared Joseph Smith's understanding of the gift of the Holy Ghost with those of his colleagues. But after 10,000 hours, I'd like to condense that now down for you into the next 45 minutes um, to discuss the nuanced difference of Joseph. Equally as important as Joseph's identifying the key role of the Spirit to President Martin Van Buren, 19th century Americans also frequently discussed pneumatology. In fact, Revelation, the depravity of man, and the Trinity were the three most famous topics used in sermons in the first half of the 19th century amongst theologians, preachers, ministers, and newspaper articles. All three of these deal with pneumatology, or the study of the Holy Spirit. The first two with the Spirit's work of inspiration and regeneration, and the latter with the Spirit's identity of the Godhead. Joseph added significantly to this discussion on these subjects, but unfortunately, unless you take a careful look, many miss the point that Joseph's views include nuanced differences of the Holy Spirit. So I hope to fill this gap this morning with a systematic documented analysis of the Holy Spirit in antebellum America. So this morning I'd like to first start out by looking at how Joseph contrasts with his colleagues in both at the Trinity, the spirit in relationship to scripture, the spirit in relationship to the gifts, and the spirit in relationship to election. And then the second half, which is really the fun part, I want to talk about how Joseph's writing compare with the King James Version in numbers, names, and details. Starting off with the Trinity. The majority of American Christians in 1800 believed in the Trinity. They passionately defended their views and ideology in the Trinity from attacks by the Deists and the Unitarians. One of the most articulate guardians of the Trinity in the, um, from 1822 to 1878 was the Reformed Christian Charles Hodge. He was president of Princeton University, which was known as the citadel of Reformed or um, Calvinism. He clung to creedal vocabulary, and he said, the Spirit is the same in substance and equal in power and glory to the Father and the Son. When we consider the incomprehensible nature of the Godhead and the mysterious character of the Trinity, 
the exceeding complexity and difficulty of the problem, we must refer to the church creeds on the subject. Whether or not a person reads, had been reading the creeds in the early 19th century of Joseph's era, the doctrine of the Trinity had been so indoctrinated that as they read the Bible, they interpreted it from the perspective of the Trinity. Biblical purists, though, like Alexander Campbell, um, refused any word that did not exist in the Bible initially. And so he stated, the word Trinity is unauthorized in a Babylonian phraseology. I don't know if you knew this, but he's Irish. So whenever you hear that accent, it's Alexander Campbell. However, I think his difference was really one of semantics. Because even though he denounces the word Trinity as Babylonian, um, in his second article of faith, he stated, I believe in one God as manifested, oh, I'm sorry, Irish exit. I believe in one God as manifested in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and are therefore one in power, nature, and volition. Other um, theologians on the fringes of Christianity from Harvard, such as Unitarian William Channing went so far as to attack Trinitarian doctrine and even the divinity of Jesus. Mother Ann Lee questioned the gender of God, and many taught of the disunity or dis um, problems with the Trinity, but no one went as far as Joseph Smith in describing the Godhead. The prophet Joseph totally rejected the philosophy of the Trinity, and nowhere in his personal sermons or writings or history did he mention the word or support its ideology. By the way, Brigham mentions the word Trinity once, but Joseph never did. Um, he never debated the traditional question of philoquy. He probably didn't even know of the debate over the mysterious character and the source of the Trinity. He broke away from Trinitarian doctrine beginning in his teens at his first vision, where he changed his views on the Godhead. And many Christians joined him in believing that Jesus was the literal offspring of God the Father, but he alone taught that the Father and the Son were resurrected, glorifying beings, purified and separate men of holiness, with the bodies of flesh and bones who were completely unified in purpose to exalt humanity. He alone diverged even more dramatically from mainstream by teaching that someday the Holy Ghost would have a body as Jesus did. According to notes taken by his scribe, Joseph preached, the Holy Ghost is yet a spiritual body and is waiting to take upon himself a body as the Savior did or as God did or the gods before them took bodies. Joseph's followers who, stare, uh, who shared his theological and eternal spirit accepted his idea as a logical outgrowth of Joseph's doctrine of eternal progression. As we looked at the Spirit's influence on the scripture, American Protestants held the Bible as their most sacred document in the world and the centerpiece of their faith. Most held it as inspired, as um, literally from the Spirit, as the source of their authority if they were a Protestant, and the endowment of their power. Christians felt that the words from the Bible were entirely gone given and the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Most Protestant preachers turned to the Bible to separate truth from error, and biblical words became their reassurance of their preaching and their guiding in their living. The Bible offered them a link to the covenant, and the Bible was also provided their potential unity among Christianity. However, Alexander Campbell spoke for many of them when he said, the Bible alone speaks the words of inspiration. No other book, however high it has been lauded, and many mighty works of genius bears upon it the pages of impressions of the mighty one. No other book, ancient or modern, whether its pretensions may behold such sway over the minds of men as the inspired volume. Now, if you look at the date on that one, um, you can see this is written post Book of Mormon, and as we know, he became quite a verbal um, uh, one who opposed the Book of Mormon. I wonder if this statement is in, in, is in reaction to that. Of all the uproar that accompanied Joseph Smith's claim as a new prophet and bringing forth a new church, the thing that was most offensive to our Protestant neighbors was the claim of bringing forth another book of scripture equal in authority to the Bible. Religious Americans saw this threat now as scriptures as endangering the Bible's sanctity and inerrancy. But interestingly, um, just days after the um, announcement of the publication of the Book of Mormon, the newspapers began printing, the Book of Mormon is blasphemy. 
It has been placed in our hands a viler imposition and never was practiced. It's an evidence of a fraud and blasphemy and credulity and shocking to both Christians and moralists. Joseph Smith and his new scripture were seen as other frauds in a long line of fanaticisms from the Second Great Awakening. Simply stated, Joseph did not fit in. Many Christians who started their own denominations in the 19th century, but no one claimed that their revelations of new scripture came from the Spirit and were equal in authority and more accurate than the Bible. It's interesting to look at Joseph standing on the gifts of the Spirit versus other Christians documented on how they preferred the fruits of the Spirit. As you know, the Second Great Awakening was riddled with controversy over these gifts. Some congregations denounced all extraordinary gifts of the Spirit, while others experimented with superlative manifestations at a new level. From healing and prophesying to screaming and barking, we find many examples of these bizarre behaviors coming out of revivals and camp meetings. There's one fabulous documentation by a well-known Methodist whose autobiography stated this. Um, okay, he's from Kentucky, so I'll try my Kentucky accent. A new exercise broke out among those among us called the jerks, which was overwhelming in its effect upon the bodies. Okay, I have to laugh because I've never had to use glasses to read before. And I'm te I team teach with Steve Young and Gospel Doctrine. We're the same age. And, and about five years ago, Steve started going like this with his text. And he said, give me a break. I can't believe this, you know. And here I'm having a hard time reading my text today for the first time. I'm really sorry. I'll keep going. I'm just feeling like Steve Young up here. Um, no matter whether they were saints or sinners, they'd be taken under a warm song and a sermon and seized with convulsive jerking all over, which they, by now, um, which they could not by any possibility avoid. And the more they resisted, the more they jerked. If they would not strive against it and pray in good earnest, the jerking would usually abate. And I see more than 500 persons jerking at one time in my large congregations. I always looked upon the jerks as the judgment sent from God. First, to bring sinners to repentance, and second, to show professors that God could work with or without means to the glory of his grace and the salvation of the world. In addition to physical manifestations of the Spirit, the Second Great Awakening also boasted of rich visionary experiences, and I personally feel that Charles Finney and Erastus Bronson share many parallels in their recounting of their first visions, as does our prophet Joseph. However, other examples are completely fraudulent, such as my favorite, crazy Lorenzo Dow, whom my husband is named after. Um, Brigham Young um, named, Brigham Young's brother is named Lorenzo Dow, and every family since then has had every generation a Dow named after this crazy Dow. And um, he called, a, he's a Vermont fellow, so you know that all the bad guys live in Vermont. All the um, crazy folks live up in Vermont at the time. And he called a camp meeting together, and he hired a little African named Gabriel, a slave boy, to climb up to this tree and handed him a bugle. And he said, when I say, Blow, Gabriel, blow. You just wail on that horn. He begins preaching, and um, he says, Blow, Gabriel, blow. The boy starts blowing, and he quotes, Amid howls of fear and screams for mercy, the congregation went down. Similar but fabricated and dubious claims of communication from the Spirit filled the 19th century histories. I don't know how many of you are familiar with these two books. But Susan Juster has found more than 300 prophets in the Second Great Awakening that claimed to be called of God to be a prophet. And Lee Schmidt does a fabulous job out of Harvard Press. Was he Yale Press? Anyway, it's called Hearing Things, um, where he documents people who had heard voices of God and felt called to the ministry. Um, however, wary ministers were very concerned about these satanic experimentations and to safeguard against the bizarre gifts of the Spirit, Christians from this era encouraged the more temperate fruits of the Spirit. Instead of looking at healings and miracles, they looked at peace and joy and love. Even Charles Finney, the very most influential revivalist in the 19th century, would not claim the charismatic gifts. And he even got to the point where he questioned the literal nature of his own vision of Christ as a young man. 
Whether he sought spiritual manifestations to bless the ministry, he said, the Lord overshadowed us continually with his cloud of mercy and gales of divine influence swept over us from year to year, producing an abundance of the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. The Methodists were famed as the fastest growing denomination in the 19th century, but even they stopped short of claiming the gift of tongues and prophecy and miracles. For those more traditional Christians, more Calvinistic, as you see in the 1800s, the Presbyterians, the Congregationalists and Baptists, um, denounced the charismatic gifts of the spirits as of the devil. However, um, the Methodist spokesman, Peter Cartwright, attributed the gifts of the spirit to the Mormons, not the Baptists or the Methodists. In an attempt to restrain the fabricated um, religious experiences of mother Mormon American preachers in the Enlightenment, there was always this need for reason. And yet, the Mormons did not quite fit in. As we look back at the first Great Awakening, in um, the father of American theology, Jonathan Edwards also began speaking against supernatural, miraculous claims. Then a century later, as we go back to Princeton, um, Charles Hodge says, modern prelates do not claim to possess any of those dramatic gifts, nor do they pretend their credentials, which authenticated the mission of the apostles of Christ. Most Christians agreed that the gifts of the Spirit evidenced in the New Testament apostles' sacred mission. Um, and Alexander Campbell was among them. The Holy Spirit was communicated by the apostles' hands. Consequently, when the apostles all died, these gifts were no longer conferred. When Joseph Smith asked others to use the same benchmark to measure his mission, he was seen as a fraud. But he stated, we believe in the gift of the Holy Ghost as being enjoyed as much now as it was in the apostles' days. He did not share the same restraints of, and, of the extraordinary gifts of the Spirit. In fact, in 1831, shortly after moving to Kirtland, he received a revelation on the gifts of the Spirit known today as Section 46, which is very interesting to me because he already had the addition of Moroni 10 list of the gifts of the Spirit in conjunction with 1 Corinthians. And so why do we need another one? And then even more emphasized to complete the entire standard works, he included it in one of his articles of faith. But interestingly, as you count out the words and look at the um, distribution of section 46, in Joseph's revelation there, the gifts of the Spirit are twice as long as those mentioned in Moroni and 1 Corinthians, um, word by word. And another thing that I think is fascinating, as you look at the section 46, five times the Lord tells Joseph, the gifts of the Spirit are only to be used to build his kingdom and to bless other people. That any time you try to use a gift of the Spirit for self-aggrandizement, it will not work from the Lord's workings. They are only to be used to bless others. As Joseph straddled these two camps, on March 27, 1836, at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, he gave the saints instructions in relation to the spirit of prophecy and called the congregation to speak and not to fear to prophesy. Do not quench the spirit, for the first one that opens his mouth shall receive the spirit of prophecy. While on this occasion he preached caution, and, and, but other times warned the saints of satanic um, deception. Every spirit or vision or singing is not of God. The devil is an orator, and he is powerful. The gift of discerning of spirits will give the presiding elder and pray for him that he might have this gift. Speak not in the gift of tongues without understanding it or without an interpreter. The devil can speak in tongues. One of his closest companions, his cousin George A. Smith, said that Joseph Smith had taught that there was no point upon which the prophet Joseph dwelt more than the discerning of spirits. Um, Joseph straddled these two camps of enthusiastically embracing the gifts of the Spirit and yet denouncing dramatic displays at revivals as false spirits. Many joined the fray of assailing fanatical diabolical Mormons in their claim to practice the gifts of the Spirit. And I was fascinated to read, back in Peter Cartwright's autobiography, he has this marvelous section on Joseph Smith um, and talking to him in 
um, Springfield, Illinois. Now, we know that Joseph often went to Springfield, Illinois, usually um, on charges uh, where he had to go before the courts, but um, he never said that one time on one of these trips I met up with this famous Methodist, Peter Cartwright. But Peter Cartwright goes ahead and gives this wonderful um, story about this conversation with Joseph. And Peter says that Joseph told him, or asked him, invited him, now go with me to Nauvoo, and I will show you many living witnesses that testify to, um, that the saints, by the saints, that they were cured of blindness and lameness and deafness and dumbness, that the diseases of human flesh and were, um, that are heir to. And I will show you that we have the gift of tongues and the spirit can drink any deadly poison and it won't hurt us. So this is what he says, Joseph said about the Mormons. But then Peter Cartwright answers in his own voice of what he told Joseph, and this is what he said. Yes, said I, Uncle Joe, but my Bible tells me that the bloody and the deceitful man shall not live out half his days, and I expect the Lord will send the devil after you some of these days and will take you out of the way. However, Joseph Smith did not ever step down from his stance on the gifts of the Spirit as we see them in all four of the standard works. Number four, election. Um, versus the sealing of the Holy Spirit of the promise. Most of the Reformed theology is based on the Westminster Confession. And the Westminster Confession establishes the doctrine of election as predestination. It reads, All those whom God hath predestined unto these earlies, unto those only is he pleased, and his appointed in accepted time, effectually to call by the word of the Spirit out of the state of sin and death. This effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man, who is altogether passive therein, until being quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Reformed Christians felt that the doctrine of election supported God's omnipotence by asserting that mortals are absolutely dependent on the divine person who gives or withholds his influence at will. Rooted in the doctrine of the depravity of man, the doctrine of election was taught at the time of Augustine and it emphasized again by Calvin that in election was entirely independent of any human behavior. God chose who he would save regardless of what the mortal did. However, in the 19th century, Americans' growing de democratic values of self-initiation and egalitarianism challenged this old-school theology to the degree that by the 19th century, election was losing favor in America, and Arminianism thought rejected this doctrine. Methodists voted to allow the sinners the right to Jesus' saving grace. And Restorationists, like the Disciples of Christ, joined the Arminian camp, although they disagreed with the Methodist timing of the Spirit. Charles Finney tried to denounce the doctrine of predestined election as hindering Christians from actively searching and seeking for God's blessings. He said, it is altogether voluntary, and therefore the Spirit's influences are those of teaching, persuading, convincing, and of course a moral influence as opposed to a physical influence because he didn't want any um, jerking or barking or anything like that. Thus, the theological pendulum swung from one extreme to the other on the Spirit's regeneration or election. Joseph Smith's doctrine on election rested in the middle of this theological schism. Unlike those Calvinists who believed that unconditional election was nothing unconditional, there was nothing unconditional about Joseph's perspective. Different than Wellesley and the Methodists, Joseph believed that one's election did depend on the Spirit's sealing ordinances in order to achieve one's um, exaltation. Joseph stated, the doctrine of election that the Presbyterians and Methodists have quarreled so much about, once in grace, always in grace, or falling away from grace, I will say a word. They are both wrong. The truth takes the road between them. The doctrine and the, of the scriptures in the spirit of Elijah would show that both faults take a road between them from according to the scriptures, if a man has received the good word of God and tasted the power of the word, to come, if they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again, seeing that the crucified Son of God afresh and put them in an open shame. So there is a possibility of falling away, and you could not be renewed again, and the power of Elijah cannot seal against his sin, for this is a reserved and made in the seals and powers of the priesthood. 
Joseph agreed with Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 that only those who worked out, quote, their own salvation with fear and trembling, unquote, could be saved by the Holy Spirit. Joseph was intrigued with the phrase, the Holy Spirit of promise, as it could seal God's elect. In a revelation that we now refer to as section 76, the Lord told him, quote, all those and who overcomes by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true, unquote. Within the next decade, Joseph received six other revelations that also dealt with this unique doctrine and elaborated on it at least six sermons of the Holy Spirit of Promise. When he spoke of the Holy Spirit of Promise, he referred to a special Melchizedek priesthood blessing that it, it, it eternally sealed ordinances and covenants. The Doctrine and Covenants describes the Holy Spirit of Promise as performing two levels of sealings, one temporary, the other permanent. Temporarily, it ratified and authorized ordinances performed by those with authority that would seal them, but it could be removed if the recipient broke his or her covenant. The temporary seal of baptism or any other ordinance was binding on earth as it is in heaven only if the person involved maintained a repentant heart. Whereas permanently, the Holy Spirit of promise was sealed to one after they met all the trials of life needed to prove their complete obedience to God in the highest heaven. In this sense, the Holy Spirit of promise guaranteed a man's or woman's calling and election. Although the word comes in the Bible, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 13, other biblical scholars, Methodist preachers, Presbyterians, everyone else who used it, I found hundreds of people who used the phrase, but they all used it to mean the promise that the Spirit would come on the day of Pentecost, never as Joseph did. Herein lies one of the problems that has led historians to place Joseph as a product of his environment. He uses the same biblical vocabulary that his peers do, but his definitions were quite unique, especially in these pneumatological matters. Rather than categorize Joseph Smith with his contemporaries in the 19th century, one best understands the prophet's pneumatology when we compare it to the Bible. So now we'll begin the second half where we look focused just on Joseph's writings, um, sacred writings compared to his biblical writings. And we'll do this by looking at, um, notwithstanding Joseph's ideas about the spirit were unconventional, he assertedly and taught that his teachings um, were grounded in the same doctrine that the Bible contained. January 1836, Joseph stated when a visitor asked him how his teachings differed from the other Christian denominations, we believe the Bible and they do not. He complained that other ministers construed the Bible through philosophical and traditional interpretations, not as the apostolic church intended. Yet, Joseph never asserted that his doctrines or his scripture were products of the Bible. Harmony and source are different things. Joseph maintained that the Spirit of the Lord taught him and that his sacred writings came through revelation and Bible study and questions. The latter practice kept Joseph's vocabulary in accord with the biblical vocabulary while building on the biblical meanings as he increased in numbers, names, and details. So let's first look at numbers. And this is where the fun really begins. I'm really, I just love this one. Um, as we look at the total word count of the Bible, you can see on these slides that the Book of Mormon is just under half the size, or not the Book of Mormon, excuse me, the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph's inspired writings, are just under half the size as, of the Bible. And yet as we look at the number of times that words regarding the Spirit are mentioned, we find 217 more uses in Joseph's sacred writings than we do in the Bible. This is just fascinating. So I want to show you in a little more detail. And I'm sorry this is hard to read. If you want to go outside, um, BYU Studies has published sort of a Reader's Digest version of my dissertation, which is um, out there at the BYU Studies table. Um, and this chart is there if you want to study it in a little more detail. But um, I took words that related to the Spirit, such as Holy Ghost or Comforter, anything that had to do with baptism by fire, and then I totaled them up. And as you look at the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and then the Biblical totals, um, you see that the New Testament has a far more than the Old Testament. This is very appropriate. Christians call the dispensation in the New Testament of the Apostle Church, they call it the dispensation of the Spirit. 
um, anytime you're talking about the, the epistles in the New Testament it, with a Christian a congregation, you refer to that as the dispensation of the Spirit. So I'm not surprised to see this high propensity of the New Testament because the, the, Old, the Book of Mormon is supposed to be set for a significant portion of the book in an Old Testament setting. But the one that is so exciting to me is the Doctrine and Covenants, where it has 63% more re references to the Spirit than even the New Testament, which tells me that one of the major focuses in the Restoration was the emphasis on the Spirit. If you look at all these words, not just the Spirit, but all of them together, the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants have 3.5 times more references than the Bible. And the Book of Mormon includes, in all 15 books, references to the Spirit. In the Doctrine and Covenants, 77, and I should, this should read 133. There's only 133 sections uh, at, attributed to Joseph Smith or his um, um, acceptance of them after other people wrote them. But 77 of those refer to the reference of the Spirit. But in the Old Testament, only 29 of the 39 books refer to the Spirit. And we're not surprised that the, the two books that have the most references to the Spirit are the books of Isaiah and Zacharias. Um, I mean... Yeah, Zacharias. And in the New Testament, 24 of the 27 books refer to the Spirit. As we look at names, this is just fascinating to me. Usually the Bible prefers short titles like the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. But when we look at the Book of Mormon, they prefer, and the Doctrine and Covenants, they prefer these longer titles that tell us information about the Spirit. They're three to five word titles. The one that's most commonly referenced in the Bible is the Spirit of the Lord. And then one time in the Book of Mormon, that's augmented to say the Spirit of the Lord, omnipotent. And as you can see, it's mentioned 26 times in the Old Testament. This is really the, the favorite way of referring to the, the Spirit of God. Um, and in the New Testament, only five times. It's not a New Testament phrase. It's, it belongs in the Old Testament. And a whopping 40 times in the Book of Mormon. Um, this to me is fascinating because when I, when I was counting up these numbers, just doing some simple math and statistics, I realized that the Book of Mormon claims to be an Old Testament text. It belongs in an Old Testament genre. And what do we see? The same references to the Spirit belong as an Old Testament text. We see a, a little bit of this, um, however, that in the... Um, oh, I don't have the, I don't have the Doctrine and Covenants one here. That's fine. That's fine. You, you get this part. Um, we see a little bit of this also in the Spirit of God, which is a New Testament phrase for the Spirit, um, in addition to the Holy Spirit, as you can see. They're a little more equal here in the Old Testament, New Testament. But again, the Book of Mormon just explodes um, with a book that's a third the size of the Bible and almost the same references. A spirit, uh, the spirit of revelation, though, is unique to Joseph. He, this is not a biblical phrase. And we see many of these phrases in the sacred writings that comes out of Je Joseph's vocabulary um, that he then incorporates into his own sermons and writings as we find in the history of the church. The same thing with voice of the spirit, which I think is fascinating because as you go and you through and you read these um, s um, statements on what the voice of the spirit meant to Joseph, um, you see these general statements where it's just someone's, um, you know, the, the spirit, the, the voice of the spirit came to us. But then there are specific things, and he said, if you will listen, you will hear the voice of the spirit, and we can see how the Lord used these phrases for Joseph. Oh, this one is absolutely fascinating. I love this one. If you look just for the phrase, the power of the Holy Ghost, you find it once in the New Testament. However, the Book of Mormon just explodes with this, and if you use the power of the Spirit and the Spirit of power, you see um, 29 references, or 30 references by, um, in Joseph's vocabulary as part of the way. And if you, you just link, so I say, okay, so the Bible doesn't like to use this little title. How about if they're just linking power and the spirit? How many times do I just see them in the same verse or the same two or three verses where the spirit is equated with power? And I found 10 of these links where the spirit's equated with power. But when you look at the Book of Mormon, 57 times the spirit is linked with power. And then this one was even more significant. The, do the Doctrine and Covenants, a third the size of the Book of Mormon, has one and a half times the numbers, or 26 times the references of spirit with power. Certainly in the Restoration, Joseph wanted this message of power to be affiliated with the Bible. I mean, uh, power to be affiliated with the spirit. Here's one that's referenced in the, in the Bible, spirit of prophecy. It's referenced, I think, in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. And um, yet we find spirit of prophecy in the Book of Mormon. And if you add even spirit of, oh, I already did that one, never mind, okay. 
Um, in the history of the church, there's a whole bunch of wonderful references. Four of those references came when Joseph was in Springville, Illinois, one time, defending himself at a court of law there, and he stated to help us understand what did Joseph mean by this word? What did he mean by the spirit of prophecy? And he, this is, and he tells us. He mentions it four times in this little talk here. If any person should ask me if I were a prophet, I should not deny it, as it would give me a lie. For according to John, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Therefore, if I possess to be a witness or a teacher and have not the spirit of prophecy, which is a testimony of Jesus, I must be a false witness. But if I be a true teacher and witness, I must possess the spirit of prophecy. And that constitutes a prophet. And any man who denies the spirit of prophecy as a prophet is a liar. Filled with the Spirit. This is interesting. The Old Testament and the Doctrine and Covenants use it as one who can, um, who can speak for, um, with the Lord. But the New Testament uses it in, in the book of Ephesians to juxtapose someone who is drunk with someone who is filled with the Spirit of the Lord. But the Book of Mormon uses this in a beautiful manner um, to describe what it meant to be filled with the Spirit. And I just wanted to read some of these to you. It's absolutely lovely. This one's from um, Nephi. When a recipient begins to prophesy... And from Mosiah, when they come forth rejoicing, or from Alma, when they're filled with the Spirit, they, um, Ammon knows the thoughts of the king. Elsewhere, the Spirit works powerfully on those called to repent so that they can experience the physical signs. Quote, my father did speak with power, being filled with the Spirit, until their frames did shake from within him. With an entire group receives an outpouring of the Spirit in third Nephi, it's described, Behold, they were filled with the Spirit. They did cry out with one voice and gave glory to Jesus. So these phrases, by looking at how Joseph was inspired to use them, um, we can get a feel for what he meant by them, and we can get a better understanding of what he wanted us to strive for in the Spirit in this dispensation. The biblical, the biblical phrases um, reiterate that four times in Joseph's handwriting or personal journal, but five more times in the history of the church. The first entry from 1836 offers a feel just for what he meant by being filled with the Spirit when Joseph said, President Zebedee Coltrane, one of the seven, saw in vision of the Lord of hosts, and the others were filled with the Spirit, spake with tongues, and prophesied. prophesied. This was a time of rejoicing, long to be remembered. Praise be the Lord. Being filled with the Spirit to Joseph carried implications often associated with the gifts of the Spirit. Um, the last one I want to look at is the spirit of bab and baptism. Now, the Bible does not use this phrase, baptized by spirit or baptized by fire, but the Bible does associate the spirit with baptism um, in both Luke and Matthew when they refer to the baptism of the Savior. Um, so as I look at these links, not in the same phrase, but just linking fire and baptism, we look at Joseph Smith's inspired writings, there are 16, and in the New Testament there are two. And then even just looking at spirit being joined with, the, with baptism, if you look at the New Testament, we then see 13. But in Joseph's inspired writings, as you can see, there are 40 there that link it. Just a fascinating number. I don't know if I've got time for details. Um, since the announcements took 10 minutes of my time, I'm wondering if I should stop to have questions or should I finish this detailed one? I don't know. I didn't see anybody walking around for questions. Okay, I'll finish. Okay. Um, the very first reference that Joseph received on this, that mentioned the word spirit in a revelation is now recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants from March of 1829. And in here he stated, Behold, who's, oh, this is the letter to Martin Harris, when Martin's trying to decide, you know, should I put my uh, farm on mortgage and should I give you 50 bucks and what should I do and all that stuff. Um, Behold, whosoever believeth on my words, then will I visit with the manifestations of my spirit and they shall be born of me, even of water and the Spirit. What does this sound like to you guys? Where do you hear this from in the Bible? Doesn't it sound like John 3 and 5? Except a man be born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, but the fascinating thing to me here is Nicodemus is left questioning. Um, and his, the vague reference to the, does not help him understand. But as we look at Joseph's detailed, the Spirit is told that if you can believe, then the Spirit will manifest you. It's almost like Joseph Smith's scriptures give you a how-to approach the Spirit. As you look at the first um, ten references on the Spirit, they're right there at the very beginning before the organization of the church. Chapter, section 5, section 6, section 8, section nine, section 11, all have a how to receive the Spirit, as if there's a handbook here. And the rules of the Spirit for this baptism by fire 
um, are, are very thorough as we look at Joseph's writings. And in Joseph's writings, they explain why you need the Spirit, why and how you enter into these things. And it's because you need a cleansing. Um, the baptism by, of the Spirit is the cleansing part of it. And first, at Second Nephi does a beautiful job of explaining this, but let's just run down to the very bottom for the sake of time. Then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost, and that they can speak with tongues and angels, they can shout in the presence of the Holy One of Israel, and then cometh the remission of their sins by fire and the Holy Ghost. In Joseph's mind, um, that is when the most important part came. As you know, at the organization of the church in eight, April 6, 1830, um, Joseph um, referred to the gift and power of the Holy Ghost as an endowment that followed baptism. The key region of the baptism was the apostolic authority which he received by the laying on of hands. And the first people that received the gift of the Holy Ghost were those who received it there at the organization of the church. Joseph taught the imperative need for baptism, both of water and of fire. At this wonderful extemporaneous sermon that he gave on July 9th, as recorded by his um, scribes, he stated, So we all agree with other Christian denominations that they all preach faith and repentance, and the gospel requires baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, which is the meaning of the original word in Hebrew and Greek meaning to bury or immerse. But we ask the other six, do you believe this? And they answer, no, I, but I believe in being converted. I believe in this tenaciously. And so did the apostle Peter and the disciples of Jesus. But I further believe in the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, as evidenced by Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two. You might as well baptize a bag of sand as a man, if not done in view of the remission of sins and gaining the gift of the Holy Ghost. Baptism by water is but half the baptism and is good for nothing without the other half. That is, baptism of the Holy Ghost. Joseph defended the Bible on the subject and likewise used the Bible as his backing to follow Peter's example on the day of Pentecost. Joseph maintained that the gift of the Holy Ghost was absolutely essential for the remission of sins through the baptism of fire. These two baptisms work together and it's not until after the remission of, ba of baptism in water then cometh the remission of your sins by the fire and Holy Ghost. This is another phrase that we see in the Bible that Joseph elaborates on in these beautiful nuanced differences, the straight gate. You see this in the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain, um, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. Enter into the straight gate, and I say unto you, if you seek to enter, you will shall abide. Matthew's a little bit longer, but it says the same way. It just says, aim for this gate, get there. But it doesn't tell you how. It's not until we get to the Book of Mormon that Joseph explains how you get through the gate. And you get through the gate as you see at the very beginning, the gate by which you should enter is repentance and baptism by water. Then cometh the remission of sins by fire and the Holy Ghost. And Joseph's writings clearly state how to enter into the kingdom of God. It is not until we receive the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants and we look at the Book of Mormon's nuanced differences, we say, this sounds just like the Sermon on the Mount. This sounds just like the Beatitudes. This sounds just like John 3, 5. But it doesn't. A close examination shows that in the restoration of the Gospel, Joseph restored an empowering spirit to bless the saints so that he would be able to raise up a righteous generation to prepare for the Lord's second coming. In conclusion, Joseph's pneumatology, pneumatology is the only one of its kind during the Second Great Awakening. He charted a new course in his doctrine of the Spirit, including an alternative to the Trinity, to election, to the differences of Scripture. He taught an eternal history of the Holy Spirit, of premortal existence for all spirits and humans, of eternal history of counterfeit spirits, of ordinances, where the laying on of hands through the spirit of the priesthood call confers the gift of the Holy Ghost. He practiced the gifts of the Spirit and the multifunctional Holy Spirit of promise that seals the righteous to exaltation. These doctrines did not arise from Joseph's environment. Certainly, 
his frontier mannerisms, his work ethic, his religious curiosity developed from his society, but his unique perspective on the Holy Spirit indicates that his pneumatology was not a conglomeration from his upbringing or his contemporaries thinking. Joseph never viewed himself as building on another Protestant church. In his own words, he claimed, I never built upon any other man's ground. Joseph's doctrine stood alone in its teachings of the gift of the Holy Ghost, just as he told President Martin Van Buren in 1839. Thank you. the questions really really quick I'm so sorry Rosalind she's a friend of mine I can't do this to a friend um, do you believe that the Holy Spirit of promise is a special ordination that the elect may receive as a secret ordinance in the temple it's not a secret ordinance I can tell you all about it it's written recorded in section 132 um, but the prophet is the only one who can give it and it is a second um, anointing just go look in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism they have a fabulous explanation of it there um, how were you able to do the word phrase count? Oh, I tell you, 10,000 hours. It was hard. But with computers, it's not that bad. Um, you know, I, I, I spent a year on the word counting. One year, five hours a day. As soon as my kids went to school, I counted words for a solid year. <laughs>